Okay. Hi, um, I'm Chetana Sachidanandan, a scientist at the CSIR Institute of uh, Genomics and Integrative Biology. And my lab uses a vertebrate model called zebrafish to study rare uh, human genetic disorders. So uh, what I'll be telling you is part of the rare diseases uh, program that we have at IGAB. And I'm going to talk about a disease called um, rubinstein thiebe syndrome. Uh, rubinstein thiebe syndrome, uh, named after the scientist who uh, classified this disease, is a very rare disease. Um, it affects around 1 in 1 lakh people. Uh, in India, it would mean a very large number of people, uh, even though it is a uh, very rare syndrome. The syndrome is basically um, something that affects multiple tissues in the um, patient. And uh, some of the distinctive features of this uh, syndrome is uh, the craniofacial, um, the facial dysmorphism that you see in the patients, very classic um, features that are seen in the patients. Uh, in addition, they have intellectual disability. Uh, many of the babies, um, when they are born, have difficulty in feeding and breathing because of problems probably in the muscles and the nerves that innervate their face and uh, the other motor neurons. The, one of the classic features of this syndrome is also broad thumbs and uh, halluses or the big toe in the uh, foot. So this, uh, is also, this disease is also called broad, broad thumb and halluses disease. And uh, there are also some patients, a significant number of patients who have heart abnormalities. So basically, the disease affects uh, all sorts of tissue types in the patients and uh, the children go through a very tough time as they are growing up. There, it is not a really a lethal disease and there are um, many of the people, the patients grow up to be adults and uh, live a successful life. But it affects multiple facets of their uh, life. And uh, the way this disease is inherited, it is called autosomal dominant inheritance. Basically, the, you need only one uh, chromosome or one allele in your two chromosomes uh, needs to be mutated and you may manifest the disease. But it's usually not inherited from parents. Mostly, uh, the, uh, most of the cases seen are de novo mutations or basically mutations that happen in... Um, patients or in the sperm or egg of the mother or the father. So it uh, usually you will not see siblings having the same disease. Uh, so the genes, which genes are responsible for this disease? Majority of the cases seem to have either mutations in a gene called CBP or another gene called EP300. Uh, the, both these genes come under the same family of um, genes called histone acetyl transferases. What happens in patients is that there is a mutation in one of these genes and it affects how the DNA gets modified by certain enzymes. That what the practical uh, effect of this mutation is that the DNA doesn't get opened up uh, when you need to make proteins from the DNA sequence. So at the right time and the right place the DNA doesn't unwind. So these proteins CBP and EP300 are responsible for opening up the DNA uh, as and when required. So uh, as I mentioned before, our interest is to use um, zebrafish to model this disease. And what is zebrafish? Uh, it is basically a vertebrate model organism, a very tiny fish, around 2-3 uh, centimeters, indigenous to India. And it has a um, system that is very similar to humans. So the genes are highly similar and the way the embryo develops uh, is very very similar to the extent that you can actually use zebrafish embryos to understand what is happening in the human embryos. So first thing that we did when we wanted to see whether we can use fish to model this disease is to compare the EP300 protein in the fish to the EP300 protein in humans. And what we find is that there is a high degree of similarity, more than 60% similarity between the proteins. And what was interesting is that the fish um, genome has two copies or two different genes that are coding for EP300. So we call it, let's call it EP300A and EP300B. 
and uh, one of the challenges is also to figure out wh which one of this is the real sort of comparative uh, gene from the human EP300. So when we did that comparison, we found that uh, EP300A in zebrafish could actually behave the similar way as the human EP300, which means it can modify the DNA and open up the DNA for uh, gene expression or protein, uh, making more proteins. And EP300B seemed to be inactive in the uh, studies that we uh, did to compare the uh, function of these two proteins. So let's now carry on with EP300A as the model for the human EP300 gene. And what we did first was to, we used um, antisense oligonucleotides or uh, small pieces of RNA that interfere with the natural expression of these proteins to reduce the levels of EP300 in zebrafish. And what did we find when we did this is that um, the fish has multiple problems uh, when you uh, decrease the levels of EP300A. And some of the uh, problems we see is first thing that we noticed is that the head is smaller which is something similar to what happens in humans. They have what is called microcephaly, a smaller head, which may indicate a smaller brain. And uh, we also saw that there is very different uh, or very um, striking problems in the face, uh, face of the human, which will be equal to the jaw of the fish. So the fish has a much reduced uh, jaw when you look uh, at the normal com control uh, animals that we are looking at. And when you take these fish embryos and actually stain for the craniofacial cartilage, what you see is that the craniofacial cartilage is much reduced and it the patterns, the, the cartilages are not in the right places, some are missing, some are reduced. So basically you will not have a functional jaw in the fish. This is very um, reminiscent of what you see in patients where they have very classical problems in their um, facial structure. Uh, we also noticed something very interesting, which was that the um, uh, the fish have uh, two fins called pectoral fins that they use to steer and swim when they are um, in the water. They are equivalent to our four limbs or our arms. And we saw that these many of these fishes which had EP300 loss had lost their pectoral fin or had very small pectoral fin compared to the normal. And if you remember what I told you about the disease before, that this is a disease that affects uh, the uh, hands, the thumbs and the halluses, basically hands and legs um, of the patients. And it's a very characteristic feature of this disease. So again, the uh, limbs or the fins of the fish, which are in sort of the homologous to the limbs of the human, are affected in, this, uh, in the fish that we made. We also went on to look at the genes that are important for making the fin, making the craniofacial cartilage and we find that there are distinctive uh, differences and loss of many of these genes which may explain why this um, sort of defect is happening in the patient also. And uh, we went on to uh, see whether there are other defects in these fishes and we saw that the fish has something called pericardial edema which is basically um, a, a swollen um, pericardium or the membrane around the heart and in fish this indicates a problem with the heart function or shape. So we went uh, on to look at whether the heart is formed normally. We used fluorescent lines where we have expressed um, sort of we can actually um, have the heart fluorescing transgenic zebrafish lines and we see that the heart shape is actually very different from the um, normal heart. So the loss of EP300 is affecting the shape of the heart and thus the functioning of the heart as well in fish. So which is again going back to what we see in humans, humans also have heart defects. Um, many, many patients have heart defects. Then I had mentioned that many uh, babies also have problems in swallowing and eating. And this could be because of neurons in the cranial region which innervate different muscles in your body and make them function when you're trying to move your jaw, eat, swallow, etc. And so we looked at markers for such neurons in the fish and we see that um, markers such as neuroD that we have used to uh, see whether the neurons are formed properly or not were severely affected. There were multiple defects in the um, head 
you could also see that the neurons in the eye were affected quite um, affect uh, very severely this also is seen in patients who have multiple eye defects um, again very similar to what is seen in uh, humans or reminiscent of what is seen in humans then we went on to look at the expression of myelin in the uh, neurons in the fish and this was this came from uh, one study that had shown that there is some problem in the myelin in the head in the brain in patients uh, but there is no um, sort of detailed study of this in um, in humans also or in any other system and we discovered that actually there is a um, reduced myelination of neurons in the body and this is not just in the brain but in the other parts of the body the trunk of the body which indicates that the patients probably have myelination defects too which may be the reason for some of the cognitive problems and also some of the neuronal problems that they have and so this is something that we knew that we have discovered that was not obvious in humans before and it would be very interesting to go back and see whether patients also have these kind of defects or not. So basically now we have looked at various systems starting from the jaw um, to the pectoral fin, heart, neurons and now the myelination of neurons and there are many multiple defects that we see. So next question we asked is, uh, is there something we can do to reverse what we see uh, in these fishes? The loss of AP300 is causing certain defects. Can we somehow reverse these defects? And the first strategy we uh, applied was to see whether some part of the protein, AP300, can be put back into the fish and can it uh, reverse some of the phenotype. So AP300 protein is huge. So the whole protein cannot be put back in the fish or in humans. It's a very uh, challenging task. But uh, the protein, as I said, is responsible for opening the DNA uh, through modifying some parts of the DNA. So we took just that portion of the protein which is responsible for this function. And that's a very small piece of um, the protein. And we put it back into the fish where we are reducing AP300 total. And it was very exciting that we saw that you could actually um, see when you inject this RNA into uh, this pieces of uh, small piece of the protein made into RNA into the uh, embryo, you can actually get back some of the um, craniofacial uh, phenotype or rather reduce the severity of the phenotype partially but still you see an obvious uh, gain in the structures in the, um, in the jaw which tells you that for jaw formation at least a small piece of the protein is sufficient to regain the function. It is not true for all the uh, defects that we have seen. We have looked at the neuronal defects and other defects, but we do not see a reversal in those. So that also tells us that you can't reverse all the uh, defects that you see with a simple piece of the protein that you have in the, uh, of the total protein. Uh, so the next question we asked was, so okay, so if you put a piece of the gene, you can reverse some of the phenotypes. What can I use drugs to do the same thing? Drugs are much easier to administer and they, are, they may lead to some meaningful therapeutics. So we used a the, uh, strategy. Uh, so as I said before, when you lose the um, protein that modifies DNA to open up the DNA is when you have this uh, disease. So what if I modify or, or kill off or inhibit the protein that closes the DNA? So basically it's a balance in the cell of opening and closing of DNA. So if the opening is not happening very well, so if I prevent the closing, will whatever is open will remain open and maybe we can actually gain some of the um, sort of functions back in the animal. So we did this by using molecules that inhibit an enzyme that closes the DNA. So um, I'm showing you two such molecules here. So just to recap, we have a normal fish in which when we have EP300 loss, we see reduced uh, head, jaw, heart defects, myelination and neuronal defects. And when we put back these molecules, which I have, um, basic, the two ones, two molecules that successfully did this was HDAC inhibitor 3 and another molecule called CHIC35. These are two small molecules that are inhibitors of the protein that closes the DNA and we uh, were very pleasantly surprised and excited to see that uh, both these molecules are able to reverse some of the phenotypes that we see and CHIC35 spe specifically could actually regain the size of the head, 
the um, jaws, the pectoral fin and you could actually see the cartilages in the um, head also uh, recovering or, or becoming more like the normal. So to summarize what uh, we have done in this work is we have created a model, a zebrafish model for human disease called Rubinstein Thybe syndrome, a multi uh, tissue affecting uh, syndrome and we get many phenotypes or many defects that are reminiscent of what happens in the patient. Um, you have a smaller head and brain, you have problems in the craniofacial uh, structure, you have problems in the forelimb or the fin and you have problems in the neurons and the heart. And then what we did was we used uh, small molecules um, or other um, RNA based uh, therapeutic to see whether we can drug this kind of a, uh, a complex syndrome that we see in the embryo and can, whether we can actually reduce the severity of the phenotypes and whether we can um, sort of uh, improve or overcome the loss of AP300 in these uh, fishes and we were able to find some molecules that were able to bring back or let's, let me not say bring back but rather um, prevent the loss of certain structures, specifically the jaw and some heart defects and the pectoral fin. So this is an approach that can be used for many other rare diseases, that is you create models in a system such as zebrafish which is easy to manipulate and study. You discover new phenotypes, you understand how the phenotypes develop, um, the defects, um, how they manifest themselves and what is the reason behind underlying molecular reason for such defects and then you can use uh, chemicals to find viable therapeutic candidates to reverse the phenotypes or prevent the phenotypes from developing in an embryo. So that is that is the summary of our work. Thank you. Okay.